name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to begin my homily by quoting an excerpt from the great Easter homily of St. John Chrysostom. You, O death, have been troubled by encountering him below. Death was in an uproar because it was done away with. It was in an uproar for it was destroyed. Death took a body and it discovered God. It took the earthly and encountered heaven. It took what it saw and was overcome by what it did not see. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Every year, every Easter, I make it a point to read through the Paschal Sermon of St. John Chrysostom. I'd encourage you to do so if you have never sat down and read his sermon. It's very short, it's very easy to, to read, but it's incredibly impactful. One of the things that I think you'll notice when you read his sermon is that its center, what, it's, what he's putting forward is that it's the power of God that conquers everything. It's very much what this night is all about. The power of God conquers everything. There is no place, there is, there, skepticism has no place in this night. Doubt has no place in this night. We are faced with God's power and we behold it and incorporate it into our own lives. I've shared with you, uh, I think before, uh, it's worth uh, sharing again a story. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking with a close friend of mine who had fallen away from the faith. And he was asking me all of these kinds of questions, you know, talk, wanting to talk about everything. And he was, he was he, he, talking about all of these questions from Scripture, right? And it was all of the, a lot of questions from the Old Testament. And he was bringing up all of these, what it seemed like kind of disjointed things. I couldn't really find a, a pattern or what was his issue here. And so he was bringing up things about the fall of Adam and Eve. He was bringing up things about angels. He was bringing up things about sin and all of this. And it all seemed very disjointed, right? And after we had been talking for like an hour, finally he just kind of looked at me and said, well, none of this really matters if Jesus isn't God, right? None of this really matters if Jesus isn't God. And in that moment, that was kind of the aha moment of that whole encounter, right? That was it. This was the thing that connected everything together. This was the thing that made everything else make sense. Because if Jesus isn't God, then our worship is in vain, St. Paul says. His preaching, he said, is in vain if Jesus did not rise from the dead. And so this night, we take great confidence in God because his power is manifested and he has shown himself more powerful than everything, even death itself. So what, are, what, are, what, are, what should our response be to this night? What should our response be spiritually and interiorly celebrating this great feast of our faith? Well, I would propose that our response should be twofold. What would our Lord say? What would our Lord want of us, firstly, in a response? Firstly, he would want us to believe, right? Our Lord would want us to believe in his resurrection. Belief is the first and most important reality of this night for us. You know, what, there's a central uh, Easter figure, I guess we could call him, right? You know, it, it, when you read all of the accounts after our Lord's resurrection, we read some of the different important figures in those post-resurrection gospel passages. You know, there's one central figure that I think gets a little bit of a bad rap, and that is St. Thomas the Apostle, right? We, we know, when St. Thomas, you know, he shows up and uh, he had missed the Lord, and he says, I won't believe, right, until I see, until I put my hand into his side and my finger into his nail marks, right, like this. And we refer to him as Doubting Thomas. I don't think it's really fair for us to call him Doubting Thomas, right? Because all of the apostles doubted, right? I mean, if that had happened to any of the apostles, I think they would have all had the exact same response. Thomas wasn't any more of a doubter than the other apostles. He was just late, right? He was just late getting there. So what happened, though, when Thomas was put 
in the presence of our Lord, when he did finally witness our Lord's resurrection, he gave that powerful and important prayer. He said, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God, would that you and I this night, as we contemplate, as we reflect on our Lord's resurrection and the power of this night, that we stand before our Lord and say, my Lord and my God, may you be the one and only reality of my life, the one and real only thing that moves me and drives me forward. How often was it in the Gospels that our Lord, whenever he was working his miracles, that he would say that your faith is what is necessary, right? I remember particularly after our Lord's transfiguration, he's there and the man with the possessed son comes up to him, right? And he says, you know, Lord, if you can do this for me, right? If you can drive this demon out. And the Lord says to him, if I can do this, do you know how, who you are talking to? He says, all things are possible for those who have faith. How many times did he say that in the Gospels? All things are possible for those who have faith. And then when the man gave that powerful prayer, he said, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. The Lord cast out the demon out of his son, right? He drove the devil out because of his belief. What it, for the devil, what greater weapon could he use against us than unbelief? What greater weapon could the devil use against us than unbelief? You know, it's a, st a known statistic now. You know the, the number one religion declared in the West today? The number one religion is no faith at all, atheism. Even more than Christianity, uh, in, in any other faith, the one, number one faith declared is no faith at all. This is very much the work of the devil. The devil knows that he'll never defeat God, right? So what does he do? He goes after the next best thing. He goes after our belief in our resurrected Lord, our belief in our Lord's power to give us what we need. Secondly, the second thing I think we, our Lord would want us to have as a response to this night to the power of this night is confident hope. Confident hope that we stand firm in the belief that Jesus has risen from the dead and we have confident hope in all of the gifts and promises that are implied by that belief. You know, we look out into the world and I think we're faced with an ocean of cynicism, right? We look out and we see all of this negativity we see war, we see Western and uh, Western culture and civilization itself. It's on the brink of collapse, right? And none of that matters because Christ has risen from the dead. None of that is more powerful than Almighty God as is shown by this holy night. So I want to leave you this night with, again, the words of St. John Chrysostom how he concluded his Easter homily and the words that he left those faithful people drawing to their minds and to their attention belief and confident hope in the power of our Lord Jesus. Christ is risen and you, O death, are annihilated. Christ is risen and the evil ones are cast down. Christ is risen and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen, and life is liberated. Christ is risen, and the tomb is empty of its dead. For Christ, having risen from the dead, is become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.